Hey, everybody. Thank you for turning in to 90 Proof Wisdom Podcast. Today we have Matt Gwynn, otherwise known as what? Congressman Gwynn, Chief Gwynn from Roy City PD, right? Known him for a long, long time. Worked with him when I was at Roy City Fire. He was always picking on me as a cop. I was trying to keep, pick on him a little bit when he was wanting to be a firefighter. Unfortunately, we had to fail him a few times. He just couldn't pass the test, you know? That was most of it. Anyway, hey, let's play a little startup. Thank you again, and hope you enjoy it. If you like it, please subscribe. If you don't, tell us at the bottom why, and we'll try to change our ways. Maybe, maybe not, but we'll see. Anyway, here we go. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. Hey, this is Houston. We're copying. Uh, everything is go here. We shall uh, fight on the beaches and in the streets. Uh, we shall never surrender. I'm in it just to rewrite history Cause I'm in the mood to Label us the leaders of the leaders of the new school This ain't for the radio Can't find this on YouTube This the type of killing that these critics say you You're a group of happy rebels You've said no to the rules of the game And the regulations of the day You've said no to the conventional wisdom You're all originals In this day and age I got time for innovation Time to be creative Time to Hey, everybody. Thank you again for tuning in. Today, like I was saying earlier, we have Matt Gwynn. He's a Utah State Congressman, also the Chief of Police for Roy City Fire. We're happy that you could come here today, Matt, and share a little bit of your wisdom, helping us see through some of the difficulties of understanding Tier 2. That's been a big topic for me a little bit on social media for our fire guys, our police guys, and a lot of the people in the Utah retirement system. And other states have some effect of a Tier 2 type retirement as well. But and we were kind of visiting the other day in regards to some comments I may or may not have posted on some social media sites. Some people don't understand what it is and how it's affected others. We have post senators from the state of Utah, like Dan Lillian Quist, that feel like it was the right move. Um, us on the lower pace spectrum, uh, it really affects as far as the ac acquiring new recruits as well as retaining our recruits. Um, that's part of kind of why I brought you here. So we had a better understanding. The citizens had a better understanding of what your goal was and your mission, at least in this little teeny section. I know you have a huge one. You've done a ton. So I want to just start hashing at it. What do you think? It's going to be hard for me to follow up that intro. I actually like that intro. And your audience should grow as a result of that intro alone. Right. So. And then putting you on it, like your beard, it has grown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he had such a cute baby face, you know? You know? It's for you. It's for me. Hey, I'm trying. Look, but I have to keep going back on duty every once in a while, and then I have to shave it. Right. When do we get rights? Like, no no having shave day. No shave day like the cops. Every day is a no shave day for us now. I know. I heard. That's a recruiting tool. Is that what you, We're is that one on that you brought in? Yep. It's on poster. <laughs> Work for us. You don't have to shave. Tats? Tats too. We can do tats. So basically what you're saying, hold on. We just get to be us? Yeah, you get to, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that is odd. Yep. You're, you're a new trendsetter. I love it. Yeah. How dare you be an individual, right? And work. I thought it was funny. You're comfortable, right? Being you, right? It, but that was kind of weird. No, no visible sleeves. I mean, I understand. I guess some people, but when they're having a heart attack, I don't think they care. They probably don't. And then when you're out there helping, I mean, let's they're be not honest. See them for sure, right? Ever, yeah. right? That's not what they're worried about. <laughs> so the other day, I got pulled over. Well, it wasn't me driving. I did get my first speeding ticket the other day. That's it was good. awesome. Good. Ninety-five on highway on I-15. Mm-hmm. It was in Wyoming Oh, yeah. the day before they got my son at 94. So, we, I mean, the family deserved it. I was doing that. The guy was a stud, though. He hooked me up. Yeah, I don't know that they care that much in Wyoming. Well, they, they still cited me, 75. He got me for 10 over, but he goes, what were you doing? I said, I was hauling ass. That's what I was doing. And he just started. See, it's your brutal honesty. <laughs> I go, I really, he goes, why? I said, well, this, it's between Mountain View and Manila. Do you know that road that goes to Flaming Gorge from Mountain View? Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of big whoop de doos The road's oh, yeah. bad. I'm like, to be honest with you, I was trying to catch some air. And he just started chuckling. He goes, really? I go, yeah. So he goes, he gives me the ticket, comes back. He goes, can I be honest with you? Since you were so fairly honest. I said, sure. He goes, I do it all the time. Absolutely. I was just going to say, he does that to and from home. I'm, and from I'm home. certain of it. And he says, I go, yeah, but you have lights on. He goes, that's true. <laughs> that helps. Anyway, so let's hear a little bit about your story. You've been at Roy PD now for? Yeah, so, well, um, I graduated high school, wasn't that great of a student, and, you know, my outlook on careers wasn't that great, and I wanted to be in law enforcement, and so you can't be a cop till you're 21. I had three years of time that I could either get in a lot of trouble or do something productive, so I joined the Marine Corps. 
Ooh. Spent four years active duty in the Marine Corps, came back home, uh, started my career in law enforcement as a corrections officer with Weber County Sheriff's Office. I was there for a couple of years, actually um, re-enlisted in the Air Force Reserves, was activated and deployed after 9-11. Uh, after my deployment, I came back. And when I came back, I finished my peace officer certification and was hired on by Royce City in 2003, where I've been ever since. You know what? I didn't know you were in the Marine Corps. That's funny. That's something we I, haven't talked about. You haven't bragged it up. I know. I got some secrets. You got to tout that a little bit. I'm proud of you. Even more proud than I was before. It's just got to be measured, right? Uh, don't. <laughs> just let it all out. You know? I And so you've been 2003. You... Mm-hmm. Officer, now you're the chief. Chief. That get, doesn't get much higher than that. No. I think you're it. How does that feel? It's weird, actually. Um, I miss being on the road. Uh, I miss hanging out with the guys, right? That camaraderie element, while it's still there, isn't there like it was, right? I have a job to do. They have a job to do. Um, I'm more of a supporting role. Um, intellectually stimulating, right? I, I, I like that challenge. Um policy and budget battles i've actually come to appreciate those uh, which i didn't know you've grown older and you decided to run for what was your first point of office when you were running for mayor on light calls and yeah stuff? so i was actually <laughs> so i was actually a planted i was appointed to the planning commission in far west in the late 2000s like 2009 2010 about that point and i uh, ran for city council did nearly f- two full terms on the city council and then uh at the end of my second term was when I was elected to the state house. So listen to this. How much you're just glutton for punishment. So you chose cop yeah. <laughs> and then planning commission, which that's pretty brutal. People, especially developers, don't love that. That has got to be the most thankless volunteer. <laughs> right. That's even more thankless than being a cop because at least I'm getting paid to be a police officer, right? Planning commission, you're trying to do what's for the betterment of your community you get paid almost nothing if anything and yeah you're not well liked by anybody the council or the developers right so that's what i mean cop planning commission then city council which is just a step above planning commission almost and then congressman and then that's all the way back behind the freaking planning commission almost just teasing <laughs> <laughs> i'm just giving you crap you know that Always, so, always willing to take it from you. You do. You always do give it to me. But you give it back. I do. You're pretty good at that. I do, but this is your show, so I'll be a little... No, this is your show. This is what we're trying to do. I want to help you. He's. You're getting redistrict, right? Mm-hmm. Isn't, isn't that correct? So you're running again mm-hmm. under this new district. Yep. So we need everybody, especially public service. You guys got to pay, pay attention in this district, especially. This is what our goal is, is to make sure we get our retirements corrected. And, and that. So will you help us understand what was original retirement for police, fire, EMS, and then the state? So we'll call it tier one so they have a, yeah. a representation. And so, then talk about what tier two is, what it was, and then how it's kind of evolved into a, a little bit better and what our end goal is. Yeah, so tier one was actually implemented in 1986, right? And at the time they were debating the bill that created tier one, I mean, it was recognized as being the Cadillac of pensions in Utah and the United States, especially when it came to public safety, right? And that was the goal of tier one. And then, you know, in due time, you have elected leaders that change. You have uh, community ideologies or philosophies that change. You have budgets that change, obviously recruitment and retention. That You know, all those things evolve over time, right? So fast forward to 2010, um, which is after the economic collapse of 2008, right? The housing market. Uh, there was concerns about the pension being able to maintain its funding status. And which was, will you explain kind of what that pension was? 50% after 20 yeah, so, years? Yeah, so you'd be 20 <clears throat> years in public safety, and then after 20 years you could retire, and you would receive 50% of the average of your three highest salaried years. Okay. So, for example, if you're making 50 grand average over your three highest salaried years, you would, try, you would retire with 25,000 $25, annualized, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. So then tier two comes in and it changes drastically. Correct. Yeah. So tier two did a couple of things. One, they were trying to combat the retirement in place problem. So you have a bunch of administrators, right, that are making substantially more money than the line officers. They're retiring in place or they're going from agency to agency as administrators. And, you know, they're making 90, 100, 110, $120,000. 
on top of their pension, right? And so they're consuming a lot of that pension and they're staying in places where they're literally profiting from the pension system, you know, according to some, right? We can have a philosophical debate about whether they should be doing that or not, right? If someone wants to hire them and pay them $100,000 to do the job and they've earned their pension, you know, ethically, morally, is there anything wrong with that? I guess that's where people can agree or disagree. Nonetheless, they wanted to stop the retirement place problem. Plus, they were concerned about the economic fallout of 2008. So they said, we're going to stop people from retiring in place, meaning if you're going to leave, you're going to have to leave for at least a year. And they knew that if people left longer than a year, that they were more than likely not going to come back. So that's why that year cooling off period was put in place. And then they increased the years of service requirement from 20 to 25 years and reduced the pension from 50% to 37%. Okay. So from my understanding, when I first had this happen, because I was full-time at the time of that changing, um, 2000, so at 50% going down to 37% at 20 years. Now, what I, what I had a conversation with, with Paul Lilling, with Dan's brother, and I was trying to just explain some of my frustration. I said, look, what I don't understand here is why you guys feel this is, this is right. And I'm going to use the fire service side, not the police service side. For me, and I don't know what the math is and I don't have a calculator, but when we work 20 years and fire does 240 hours a month, right? And then a typical full-time service job is 160 hours a month. The way I look at the math is if we are able to contribute to a bucket of let's call it 50,000 hours over 20 years at 240 hours a week, but it takes you 30 years to contribute 50,000 hours to that bucket to qualify for retirement. Should it really affect us on the fire side, right? I'm like, I don't think that's right that we've already contributed 33% more hours in the same amount of 20 years. You're going to take 30 years to get into. Well, he, he, the, the debate was, well, that 20 years, you should have to work more than 20 years. I'm like, but it's hours in right for the fire for, at least for me. And then the same argument goes for cops. I, I didn't quite understand why they felt like they should attack the lowest of the totem pole. Now, there's also some adjustments that were made on the higher side of the scale, and I don't know exactly what they were, so I don't want to knock them out and, and try to argue the point I'm not 100% aware of. But it felt like the lowest appreciated, lowest paid in the cities, police, fire, EMS, were the ones that got hurt the most, and then the higher scale seemed to have a little bit of an adjustment up, right, inside the councils or inside, inside the state. So... I feel like, it, well, and we know immediately after that, the economic crash happened. We had a huge influx of people willing to work because there wasn't a really a lot of jobs to be taken on the private sector. And they wanted a little bit more of a safety net. Well, it might be an aluminum safety blanket, but it's still a safety blanket. Nonetheless, it offered you retirement and insurance and in a pay that you could get. And we saw a huge influx of people applying. And then after which, when the economy gets better, and you see that we don't have the retirement, you don't have the pension, you don't have the need, people, they just aren't applying. There's better jobs. And then on top of that, you add to this pot of public discontent with public service. Mm -hmm. And there's no respect for any of those jobs, really. Right. So there's no real allure to come and no, stay. There's not. And, you know, in having this debate, we can talk about my bill file that I opened last year here in a minute, but, you know, all the decisions that are made at the state and even at the municipal level, right? They're supposed to be data driven, which is fine. They should be data driven um, decisions, right? They should be objective and they should be void of emotion. The problem is, is when you're dealing with public sector, specifically public safety employees, right? You have to do this qualitative analysis, right? The quality of life analysis along with the quantitative side, right? So you have the data side and then you have the quality of life side, right? And so when they were having this debate back in 2010, you know, they were th saying things like, well, the average officer is not retiring until they hit year 24. So it really theoretically wouldn't be that big of a deal to say, okay, we're just going to have them work one extra year. The difference being is they were voluntarily staying until year 24. And now you're saying you have to stay until, until year, year 25. 25. But there's a kicker to that. 
those extra years that you contributed for four years, there was a reason people stayed is because they were getting, what was it? One and a half percent per year for their three average. Yeah. They were trying to get their three average high Mm -hmm. on on the high. And then on top of that, for every year after 20, you got a little extra kicker into your retirement percentage average. Right. So there's, it's not just that equal. Correct. 24 years plus your highest three plus the extra point and a half or so that you got every year that you added to the bucket. So you'd get 55%, Mm -hmm. let's say, for example, inside that retirement pal. And so there's a reason people gave those extra years. One, they might've been young enough. Two, they felt like they could contribute. Three, they wanted a little bit higher pension and they were in their highest earning wages of their career. Obviously at the end of it, you're typically making the most. How interesting would it be if we could actually take the operating environment we have now, right? And apply it to the discussion they were having back in 2010. I don't know that tier two would have actually, I'm not saying that it would have never come to fruition. I'm thinking it probably would have looked a little different. I a hundred percent agree with you, especially now, especially with the ability to hire right now to give everybody an idea. Also, Matt for, failed to mention, he's also on the board of directors for Weaver fire district, right? I was, yeah. You're no longer. No. When did you leave? I, so that was part of my city council assignment. And so when I resigned my city oh, council so now you're in the to Congress. go to the state, I had to resign Well, your picture's my, still up. <laughs> they love them and I love, they, they, I love them. They love me. And they, I think they think you're cute a little bit. They're a great picture. Pretty adorable. <laughs> anyway, so he's pretty familiar. Right now, I've noticed that Weber's firing, or firing, hiring, probably both, but mm-hmm. hiring at fifteen thirty-five an hour, right? And here's the issue. And we were discussing this, I think, with Kevin Ward in his difficulty in hiring right now. Our average median household cost for a multifamily house in the state of Utah is four hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Our average single family dwelling is four hundred and sixty five thousand dollars. Again, a full time career fire guy, fifteen dollars and thirty five cents an hour. Minus taxes, minus union dues, minus PFFU dues, minus your insurance, minus all the other things. At the end of the day, you're ending up with ten bucks an hour. Food. Food. Yeah. Well, so then if we have a hundred, well, 240 hours, we're going to end up, let's call it 2000 net a month. Well, at a $400,000 multifamily house, you're going to be 1600 bucks to 2000 bucks, depending on your credit score. You have no food, no car, no shoes, no, no activities for your kids. So absolutely have to work another job Yeah. on top of your 240 or, or even 160. And so where is it fair that we have to expect, like you said, and I love the way you put it, the quality of life, right? Where is it fair that we expect these guys to have to sacrifice two careers, 80 hours a week to well, be able to afford to live? you're a servant. That's expected of you. Right. And we shouldn't be bitching, right? That's, that's kind of the, the problem. Mm-hmm. So those guys, and here's the other thing I can't stand, and this is why I've gotten louder, I think, is I love working fire and EMS. I love it. I wouldn't do it if I didn't. That's one of my favorite things of my whole life. But I don't need the paycheck as much as I used to, right? Yeah. And- I go to the firehouse and I listen to some of the stories and it's sad to feel like, why is this such a hurdle? And I forget, I've kind of, I don't mean to say it in a way, but I, I haven't had to be there every, you know, 10 days a month. I work two to four days a month. So when you hear some of the stuff that people are having to go through just to try to rub two nickels together, it makes me more irritated. And I'm like, look, if I have to get fired, then I don't give a shit. I, I go ahead. But the problem is I'm going to go swing for my guys because yeah. they can't, they can't even speak up. They're so afraid of the people that control their pension, their wage, their insurance. Like they, there's people out there and you both know who, who we're talking about that wave this flag that they control you. They control your wage, your retirement, your insurance, and you do what they want and you speak up against them and you're gone, right? There's people out there that have that role that can do that or have had that role. And so for me, I'm like, look, I'll be that voice. I don't really care, but someone needs to chirp it. And when I saw that you were working on tier two, that's when I reached out. I could have cared less that we work together or not. If you were in Congress and it was someone else, I absolutely would have reached out because this is a huge problem inside the firehouses, at least where I, I spend my time and you spend your time in the police house, but it's a problem. They don't, they already don't have enough to live on, but yet we're going to make their retirement that much worse. Mm-hmm. Right. So the only thing I can think of is to get people like you, give them a platform to be able to talk about it, show them that their congressman and their Congress does care, at least some of them, some of them may not, but I need them to know who does and how you do really try. And you are swinging bats at that level in the state. You may have some 
<clears throat> people pushing back, right? Quite honestly, the the amount of pushback I was getting last legislative session, um, I mean, we haven't started the next session yet, right, where this bill is going to be introduced. Um, but I'm already starting to see a lot more support now for a bill that hasn't even been introduced than I was for my bill last year after it had been introduced. So last year, my bill didn't even get through rules. And it only addressed the cooling off period. It did nothing for the years of service requirement. The bill that I'm introducing this next session addresses the five years and the cooling off period. Nice. And and, and I seem to be getting on that part. I, I can't really name a lot of people right now. Um, one, because I don't have their permission. But what I can tell you behind the scenes, there's a lot of parts that are moving. We have a lot of people that are interested and involved. We actually have talked to people that were part of the negotiation and had voted in support of Tier 2 who are now saying, you know, while there were aspects of it that needed to be implemented, that, yeah, it appears that maybe it did go too far. And we only knew what we knew at the time when we made the decision. So, you know... I don't want to question anybody's motives. I understand why they did it. Well, they, and because they felt like it was an economic crisis that was going to be forever lasting. Right. I mean, you can see that, but sometimes yeah. we can't see our, you know, nose despite our face. Now, to 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 their credit, though, they acknowledged back then that municipalities and counties and other jurisdictions that maintain their own public safety offices, right, they were going to have to pay better salaries, and they weren't doing it, right? Well, our own senator said that. They said they recognize it's going to cost them more yeah. per hour or per year by 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 pay. But that never got adjusted. Seven no. years we went without a raise yep. at Roy. Seven years, man. So that's up to the municipalities and the counties, right? right? They were told in the beginning, you need to step up, right? And it's I don't know where the league was or where the cities were in support of or against Tier 2. But what I can tell you is it was predicted and it was known that salaries were going to have to increase. And those who are responsible for doing that weren't doing that. Right. And, and, and why is that important? Well, it's important for a couple of reasons, but one I found interesting this morning that I just discovered on accident. So you neglected to tell everybody that I'm also an adjunct up at Weber State University. Oh, I forgot. That was, yeah, so. hey, you didn't do that in your own intro, bro. You can't come after me. About <laughs> I wanted neglect. you to do my intro. I don't want to do my own intro. I, hate this. <laughs> I don't like that. Anyway, so I, I have a, I, I teach a, I teach a class up there. It's a public administration introduction class. Wait, so. does it adjunct mean you're boring? You know, <laughs> you, this particular class, they're not, you know, they're not terribly excited and very vocal, right? right? So I got to try and engage them a little bit more, but okay, um, it's just an intro class into public administration, right? And so really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to open the curtains on what running a government agency is really like, right? Um, you know, we, we all have these preconceived notions about how government operates. I had those when I was running an election, right? I, mm -hmm. you know, was saying a lot of things that sounded awesome. And then I got elected, and then I learned that I actually now had access to data that I didn't necessarily have before. And so I'm having to eat crow a lot, right? Which is great that you can. Right. right. So, but now that I have that understanding, and now I can, you know, kind of deliver that message to those who are actually interested in getting into type of, you know, into some type of public administrative career, whether it be teaching, public safety, even, you know, something to do with infrastructure, what have you. But... Part of their um, part of their curriculum is this: they they have to um, debate and implement a budget. And so I divide the class between appointed officials and elected officials. And so they're acting in those two roles. They're given a budget. They're given a bunch of problems they have to solve, and um, they have to come up with a balanced budget at the end, mm -hmm. right? And are we going to hire police officers? Are we going to hire firefighters? Are we going to build more parks? You know, those kinds of things. Are we going to increase salary? The, right. All those things I try and present a problem and all the data that I collected for this assignment was factual data taken from around here. And I'm reading it off to him this morning. I'm like, this just seems so wrong. Right. So at the time I wrote the assignment, which was back in 2016, the median income for say far West Plain city, that area was, I think it was like 72,000 for a household. household. For That's a two household. working people, right? Right. And and the median home value at that time was like 210,000. I suspect median single family, not multifamily, yeah, right? Correct. Yeah. And so I suspect <clears throat> that home values have skyrocketed 465. I suspect wages have not kept up. Well, let's see. So when I left Roy, I was making 560 or 1565 an hour. Right? That was June 2016. Paramedic yeah. fire. And now I believe they're approaching around that $17 range. 
Roy City is the, and I got to be careful. Of what no, I'm that's saying, fair. Right? They're but on the I, lower pay scale. Uh, we were Roy City. When it comes to law enforcement, we are the lowest paid agency, starting wage in the county. Wow. I'm trying to fix that, and I think what is? Do you mind if I ask what's the starting nine, wage? Nineteen thirty-eight. Wow. Take a bullet. It it pays almost twenty bucks. It's worth it. Yeah. So there was <laughs> there was a sign up. Parsons Del- is hiring at twenty-five. Yeah, for drivers. Right. We're hiring at almost. Yeah. Del Taco at 44.19, right? So this police officer that's making 19.38 an hour goes through the drive through at Del Taco and there's a there's a note on the sliding glass window that says you can come work here graveyard shift free meal plus 20 bucks an hour. That's not. And you're both on graveyard. And you're both so on here graveyard. you're on graveyard. Yeah, I'm already awake. Making, I might as well get a free taco and make 60 cents more 60 an cents hour. more now. Yeah. That's a hard one for you. So tier 2, the the goal by rectifying this is one helping stabilize a long-time retirement career for people that sacrifice through public service, right? And that, when I say sacrifice, I don't mean that we're working for lower wages as a sacrifice because we know there's services that do pay well in the state and in other states, but also the time away from home, the risk factor that you put on your family, not only the risk factor physically that you put on your family, but the mental risk factor that you expose yourself to every day that your family has to deal with the post-traumatic whatever it may be for a lot of us, right? The PTSD that they feel. <clears throat> your wife, your kids, my own kids, like, no, you're not jumping on a trampoline. But, you know, or yeah. whatever it is that the call you've been on yep. for that week, you're just like, nope, you can't do that. Yep, you're not jumping on a trampoline. You're not driving. You know, sorry. You yeah, you can't, can't ride with your friend. No, yeah. you're not going to prom. No, you no. can't have a cell phone. Mm-mm, your friend's not driving to prom. You're going to be, yeah, no cell phones because of all the crap that you see inside mm-hmm. the cell phone and the cyber bullying and the cyber, all the crap that these kids are having to deal with. So you, you look at the quality of life and you say, okay, tier two is just one aspect to show people that we care. And it's a tool in several ways, at least the way I see it. And it may be different, but I'd like to understand what your goal is inside tier two, how that will help public service on the police side, the fire side, in the state in general, when we have, what, what is your end goal for it? So my end goal is, right, it's supposed to be this holistic approach, okay. right? Um, economically speaking was tier two the right thing to do it probably was and so my bill does not change the funding mechanism that was implemented as part of tier one okay right so it stays tier two funding the only thing i'm changing is the years of service requirement well why is that important well 20 years was selected for a reason right and it doesn't make any sense to me that if you know that 90 percent 95 percent of your staff are going to be afflicted with uh, some form of PTSD by the time they ever hit year 20, then why on earth do you want to make them wait 30 and force them and to 25. work an, an additional five years, right? I mean, if you want to have a, an argument about cruel and unusual punishment, let's have that argument. Right. Um, well, I think there's another thing that comes to that, not just cruel and unusual for the police officer, but then when you want the best of your cops on the street and you don't want them to be soured and be that guy that you're afraid of as a cop, well, you probably shouldn't put them through the last five worst years of all their experiences, right? Yeah. In addition to what they've gone through, right? You know, and it's again, it goes back to if they want to stay longer and they're physically and mentally capable of doing so, then please, great. But let that decision be on them, right? Um, you know, the military retirement, that's 20 years. And it doesn't matter if you're an aircraft mechanic, it doesn't matter if you're an infantryman, and it doesn't matter if you're in human resources, human resources. that is 20 years, mm-hmm. right? And there's a reason for that. And uh, last year, the legislature passed a bill, and I supported the bill, right? But if you're a if you're a military retiree, your income is now tax free in the state of Utah. Now, why did they do that? Well, during the debate, we heard that you know military retirees are actually leaving the state of Utah to go to states where military retiree income is already tax free. And so, what are they taking with them? Potentially, their families, their spending dollars, right? So they're not contributing to the economic base, and so during the debate in support of this bill, we hear things like, you know, they can retire after 20 years, right? We want them to come here. We want them to stay here. We want them to spend our, you know, their money here. We want their families to live here and grow up here. They're going to be contributing. That was so hypocritical to the public safety argument. And that frustrated me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them didn't even know that the argument they were making was hypocritical to that of the argument that was made in support of tier two. And so as I started pulling them aside one by one and, you know. The same thing you just said about military. Why are you treating public safety any different? I mean, they're literally doing what our military members are doing. They're just doing it here at home. Yeah. Right. Same. 
They yeah. have your back. So that is when the table, I think, started turning as far as support of my bill is when I was able to have those conversations. And I, you know, I didn't call them out on the House floor. I didn't call them out in committee meeting, right? I mean, I'm starting to talk about it more in that light, but I've already approached them and had that discussion with them in private. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's one thing that I'm doing and trying to get support for the bill. Um, but going back to the question, you know, what am I doing? How am I doing it? How is it going to help? So again, it's holistic, right? They said back then that cities in and, and counties need to pay more. All right. So we are finally starting to see them step up. I think it's 10 years later, 10 years later, right? It wouldn't be so drastic if they would have just started doing it incrementally in the beginning. Right. And so now you have this fight to the bottom, this race to the bottom, trying to get staff and we're poaching people from another agency to another. And they're in this bidding war. And then you have other agencies like mine, right, wrong, we can have, again have that discussion later, who are just kind of lying back and subjecting themselves to the torture of being understaffed. But waiting well, you're a great to training see. ground. You're a busy department that runs a lot of calls right. and low pay, so you get people early and you don't have seasoned vets because they won't stay for that. Yeah, but uh, can and we... they bounce and be great cops everywhere else. Right, yeah, and spend $100,000 You've done a great job training them all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the other thing is, too, is, you know, do we think that there's going to be end of this bidding war and how, how, you know, what's going to be the end? I don't certainly want to be the one going to my city council every six months. We need more. We need more. So we've had this conversation inside our, our board meetings here at Murphy door and Don Blom. He's one of the guys that I just ultra respect. He's been on our board for quite a while. He's got an extreme background of chief operating officer and he's been on, you know, capital committees like Swanson capital group and so forth. So when you talk about your wages and training, attrition is, the most controllable expense of a company, mm-hmm. right? This is something you just said, spending 100,000 in training. Well, if you're gonna have them here and then you might keep them two years until they have their two years experience, you've invested 100 grand. Yeah, you're paying them 40, $42,000 a year, plus you've invested 50,000 a year for the two years that they were there in their training. They really made, or they cost the city the 90 grand and they bounce and take that experience to Salt Lake City and they make their 70 grand or whatever that number is. So here at Murphy Door, we were paying packagers $12 and 50 cents an hour. And then I went in and out burger and they had a sign that says 13, 15 hour at the time. So it's always hard to adjust wages, right? And this is again, the, I use packagers not because they are the final eye on our business. So they get to see the last product and that's who really keeps our reputation up making sure we don't ship garbage. But at the same time, that is the starting point really before you get into milling and assembly and all that stuff. Cause you really get to see how everything looks. Well, we went to Don and we, we talked about raises and he, and he said, well, look, you can always be at the bottom of, of the pay scale and you can be what you feel like is the most is more profitable because you're making it off your employees and people are coming there as last result. Right. So you can end up with the people that all the other people reject. Mm-hmm. Right. And then so you get them because they're the only ones willing to work for that. Or you can be the lead horse where everybody's trying to get into and then you pick your cream and then your attrition costs go way, way down. Your, your retention is way higher. You have trained experience, quality goes up, returns go up or go down, warranties go way down, right? And he was dead on. Like, so we've moved it. Our base pay starts at 1650 if you take benefits and that's two weeks paid vacation, week of sick, week of holiday, health, re- health insurance, tuition reimbursement. We give as much as you can after your 90 day pr- probation, right? It's just, we try to do the same thing as, as public service. Like, why do you have to be a public service to get this kind of benefit? Let's do it. Well now, or if you take, if you say, no, it's 19 bucks for that job, if you don't want benefits, right? Mm-hmm. So almost, we're just shy of Roy City Cops for packagers. That makes me sad for you guys, right? I'm like, wait a second. These guys have a pretty cush job. They're just making sure that the door stays safe, right? Which is extremely important. But at the same time, our ability to hire, the quality of applicants that we've seen, the people, their, their ability to come to work on time, just everything that we have has gone way up. Our revenue per unit has gone way up, net revenue per unit. So what Don just said, look, if it costs you, let's just do a simple math of $4 an hour times 40 is 160, right? A week times four weeks, what? 640 bucks. He's like, and if you've got top quality people and you can get one more door out a day, you're dropping $20,000 to your top line 
for 640 bucks a month, would you do it? Mm -hmm. And I said, every day. He goes, so I guess we're giving everybody raises. And I said, guess so. Well, I look at the police department, the same thing. It's like, look, are we really saving anybody anything by being so frugal on the pay? Right. Your benefits are great. I mean, I've worked, I had Roy's benefits. They were decent. The retirement could be better, but they were good benefits, right? We just need to make it so they can afford to live in Roy. But right now they're having to drive to Malad to just try to afford to work for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is really kind of a, a frustrating piece for me to watch you have to go through. So in the idea of tier two and I, and back to your question, I'm hoping that that's part of the tool that you're using to help recruit and keep and retain people in the service. Yeah. So it's fascinating, right? We get, we get so narrowly focused on this cost savings, right? So fiscal notes, kill bills in the state legislature period, right? The qualitative analysis aside, that doesn't really matter what they're focused on is the cost, right? Cause you have a certain set of numbers, right? You have a, a finite amount of money in your budget and you have this nearly unlimited or infinite number of requests for that money. Right. And so one of the things that we're going to be discussing moving forward, and, and again, I don't know how much of this, you know, took place in, in the debate back in 2010. That was before my time. I've gone back and listened to some of the um, debates. I haven't listened to all of it, but my bill as it stands right now is expected to cost an additional, I think it was $4 million for the five-year rescension or the, rescinding the five years, right? And that's going to be another fourteen million just for the cooling off period to be reduced from twelve months to sixty days. So fourteen million, right? In a five and a half, six billion dollar budget, that's really not that much. But you have a ton of people asking for a ton of money for different things, right? And that all gets prioritized. But what we're neglecting to see is, again, during the original debate, they said, okay, municipal salaries, county salaries, right? They have to go up, right? Well, they have gone up. But the problem is, is because of tier two. And we know for a fact that since 2011, that recruitment and retention has decreased, right? We know that by looking at post-academy numbers. We know that that is a fact. We know that in 2010, agencies weren't necessarily having to sponsor cadets because cadets were willing to put themselves through. That's no longer the case, right? Agencies are having to sponsor cadets and they're having to Same pay their salaries. And their, yeah, right? So... So now the argument we can have is, okay, so now we're paying more for salaries, which, which is good. But now we're also paying these other costs regarding turnover, right? And if you, if you look at $100,000, which we're seeing is about the cost for maybe a firefighter and police officer, $100,000 per person per year, well, that adds up to $14 million pretty quick, Right. How many people in police and fire in Utah? Do you know that number? Um, I don't know total, but I, for fire and police, I do know that there's about 4,000 active police officers in the state of Utah. Okay. So there can be a little less firefighters, right? I it, guess. It, it, I, again, I don't know for firefighters, but when I say 4,000 police officers, that's corrections, that's deputies, that's street that's cops. all the way across the board. Yeah, that's all law enforcement. Working post-certified cops. Post-certified cops, yeah. Bailiffs, right? That that mm -hmm. number's included in all of that. Um, again, I don't know what the fireside looks like. So I'd, I'd guess it'd be a little less, but I don't know if it's that much for that off. Well, even if it's 2,000. So you got 6,000. And, and those numbers actually come from URS. Do they? Mm -hmm. huh. Well, so you have attrition. So you're trying, number one, the acquisition of employees. Right. Well, you talk now and it's not a sexy thing. People aren't applying. No, they just don't. That's not part of their career objective. It doesn't have anything that's luring them. You don't have the pay to lure. So before, well, they don't have great pay, but they have wonderful retirement. So I like the retirement program at 20 years. I can still do a second career so I can accept a little bit less. Come work for Murphy Doyle when I retire. You're welcome to every day. And not only that, but I'm talking about for you in fire and police, there was always that. Like they may not have something great, but we have great retirement mm -hmm. or we have great insurance back in the, when I first started at Roy, we didn't have a whole big cost of health insurance is almost nothing. Right. Right. And then it's just escalated to the point where you're like 250 a check or something crazy. Yep. So on top of our wages, not going up for seven years, it just kept going. We actually had a decrease in paychecks for a while. Our paychecks annualized at Roy went down. Our department numbers, our staffing has actually gone down. Since so then. as the population of the city has grown, and calls for services increased, the number of responding officers have dropped. Like paid staff positions has dropped. And the ones we do have 
we can't fill. I've got two vacancies right now. So if I you're had, looking for work, right? I come had <laughs> for nineteen thirty eight an hour starting, but we give one for one, right? <laughs> so, um, I had I've got two positions vacant. I uh, had four that I interviewed a couple weeks ago. I gave offers to two. Neither one accepted the offer. One is actually considering leaving law enforcement altogether, which is also being supported by data we have now. The other one went to another agency that could afford to pay more for his years of service. So the third candidate, next in line, give him a call. While I'm waiting for these two to call me back, that person has accepted another offer at another agency. And then the fourth guy I just wasn't going to hire. So you're still zero. So I'm still zero. So the way to fix this is what is there that we can, obviously there's a pay issue, mm -hmm. a retirement issue that would, mm -hmm. even if you don't quite have the fence, like let's say private sector can pay more than public sector. That's a given most yeah. of the time, right? But private sector pu or public sectors had the opportunity to say, look, we have great insurance, which I personally think is something we ought to look at post retirement insurance as well. I know that's swinging for a fence, but that's why a lot of people are going federal, right? They're leaving public service in private or in in city sector going to the feds because they know if they put in their five years post that they'll have lifetime insurance and they're it's a better deal for them so to me police fire there should be some type of health care that comes along with the retirement base whether it be medicaid medicare whatever that that may look like but it's something that is is also deterring right it doesn't have a a, a good retirement it doesn't have a a good post-retirement health insurance or such, some type of care. And then the pay isn't enough to really be lucrative. So now you have people that have the desire that want to be cops. They have the desire that want to be police and fire, but they can't afford to do it. If they want to afford to live in Utah, the jobs don't provide that opportunity for them to do it. You know, it's, it's fascinating. Um, if the retirement system had been left alone and have, had wages kept up with the economy, I don't think we'd be sitting in a very different place than we were in 2010, right? You have the change of the retirement system that was a direct result of concern about the economic collapse of 2008. And then at that exact same time, you saw cities or municipalities or counties um, kind of pulling back on the number of merits they were giving and how often they were giving them because of the economic fallout, right? Mm -hmm. And so had we been able to keep up with the pension and had we been able to keep up with salaries, I think we wouldn't be even be having this discussion right now. At all. At people all. would still be here. Like, look how many people in the fire, look at Roy. I mean, when I was at Roy, even Weber now, but look how many people that have left fire altogether. Ogden City too. They they either go from here, Salt Lake, right? That seems to be the, the biggest thing is people are heading south a little bit for more money. But yeah. if not... They're not leaving going there. Guess where they go? To another job. Real estate or their own endeavors or they're working in construction again because it's booming and it's paying 10 bucks more an hour. They forego the insurance or the retirement because they just can't afford to even pay their bills. Yeah. And that's the hardest part. I think at the end of the day, when you really truly can't afford to not only pay rent with your standard base pay, but you're not eating either, that you are forced to work another job just to be able, and I shouldn't say forced, no one's forcing you to do anything. Right. But in the aspect of, if you wanna have a livelihood, if I'm gonna take you out for dinner, if I wanna go on a date, while trying to keep a marriage together, and you wonder why public services divorce rates are way, way, way higher than the normal divorce rate in the, in the other sector. Well, actually, I'm getting information now where spouses are actually getting involved in the conversation and they're telling their public safety significant other Right, whether it be their firefighter significant other or their cop significant other, you need to find something else to do. Yeah. Right. I don't, try that, that I don't know that that's ever a conversation I would have ever had with my wife 10 years ago. Right. Right. Um, but now you understand and appreciate why they have to have that conversation. Oh, absolutely. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, cult, yeah, we, we all want to work in a culture or an environment with a culture that we, we love, right? We mm -hmm. want to be a part of. But that doesn't pay the bills. And, and I, can, I can sacrifice working in an environment that I may not be ecstatic about. If I can if, pay my if bills. If I can pay my bills. And I'll put it back to June 2016 when I left Roy. I loved working there. I loved that city. I loved you guys. You know, we, I got, when we got pulled over, I forgot to finish that story. My wife was speeding in Woods Cross and, and I had fire plates on and I was in the passenger seat. 
the cop walks up. He goes, so who's the second responder here? <laughs> right? I'm like, what's the second responder? And I'm like, oh, Dick, I get it. You're always first on scene, and we have to sit in the fire truck waiting for you to clear yeah, the scene so we're awesome. safe when we enter. And anyway, scene I, security jokes are never old. But that they was a classic one, right? Mm -hmm. Who's the second responder here? Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, hey, you know what? It's true, though. So what I loved about the camaraderie we had, and I think most of Weber County has right now, barring a couple people, right? But that's not fair to overall base of our Weber County Police Department's is that it is such a good brotherhood that we know that we go in, we're going to be safe. And you know that when we're behind you and something is to go weird, then we're, we've got you too, right? It's just, it's this fun type knit. And so to leave that family that I had, that was one of the hardest decisions I think I've ever had. It's like, I'm going to leave Roy. I'm like, oh, wait a second. I want to be a Roy boy, right? That was, I want to be yeah. one of those guys that are just here. But it was just not even remotely feasible. It was not something I could afford to do anymore. Now, time and money, right? Every day I'd go to work, I noticed our revenue dropped. There's a point you have to change, mm -hmm. you know, what you're doing. But at the same time, if it was even just a little bit more, it wouldn't have been as easy. Well, it wasn't easy, but it wouldn't have been even something I don't think I would have entertained. And, and you look at the people that truly have no other outside source of income, or if they're in the construction sector and it's winter, and they are left with, like you got a lot of roofers, you got a lot of cement guys and tile guys in this, in fire, police. What happens? Their paychecks dry up. Their wife are told to have to go back to work. They've got four kids at home. It costs more to babysit than they do make. So they're caught in this pickle where, hey, look, I can't, I can't work because I can't afford a babysitter. Mm -hmm. I can't not work because I can't afford food. Honey, you have to do something different. I don't care what it is, right? Parsons is paying 25 bucks an hour. What, whatever, you need to do something different. And that makes it really hard for us, you know, as, as leaders, you're running in and going, I'm not in the public sector leading, but for you guys as a chief, I mean, what, what, you can't even say no. When Chief Watt was here, he's like, yeah, I would go there. Yeah. Don't, don't stay here. The, I don't know why you're even applying here. Yeah. I, I suspect, right? I mean, our city council, I'm confident, is going to do something. Do I wish it would have happened sooner? Sure. But Whatever happened prior to my appointment, I don't have any control over, right? So I can only deal, you know, work with the cards I've been dealt. Um, Back to the rear view mirror and the windshield, right? It's a little yeah. teeny rear view. We can look yeah. that to the past. Uh, yeah. We learned. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm yeah. not there anymore. So I, I feel I feel frustrated because I know these guys have been waiting and waiting and waiting, and, and they've been loyal, and they don't have to be. And that's the other thing, too, about this new generation that's coming into our workforce. They're not loyal to anybody when it comes to work, right? They're loyal to themselves and their family first and foremost, right? Right. The culture is probably not something they're going to appreciate till they're older, right? They're there to get paid. They want to go to work. They want to get paid and they want to go home. I'm going to say this about Roy, not in a negative way, but kind of, but there's a lot of people in the fireside that held on those empty promises that said they were going to address it. They were going to address it. And it was a cliffhanger for mm -hmm. a long time. Yep. And it's really frustrating. And you did have that old blood that stayed and stayed and believed that it was being addressed and it believed it was being attacked and it was going to be handled and they were going to be taken care of. I don't think anybody works in the first off public service for, for the pay. Second, I don't think they stayed at Roy for the pay. They had a mission, they had a goal, and they loved the camaraderie there. Mm -hmm. And they believed that the leaders were doing the best they could to take care of them. When they said, hey, we're going to we're going to address it. They truly believed it. And then when it got missed, like, hey, budgets didn't get there. We didn't make the money. We thought that's fine. Well, it was kind of maddening when all of a sudden you saw a new truck from Chris Davis rolling in on the same year. We don't have budgets to even give us 10 cents, right? I, it was one of those things that, granted, you have a car replacement. I understand the whole fleet side that you don't, that a lot of people don't see. But I, at the same time, it's frustrating. It's optics, right? It is optics. Optically, sure. it's is there frustrating. A reason that, is there a reason why you're seeing new vehicles? Yes, there is a reason. Yes. But if you don't understand the reason, then you're right. The optics are horrible. And, and the, last thing, the last thing someone wants is a lesson on public administration when they're literally having this debate with themselves or their spouses whether or not they need to be transitioning from one career to another, right? After they don't want to be or... educated. They just want to know that they're going to be supported. They want to come to work. They want to do their job. They want to feel supported while they do their job, and they want to go home, which is which is interesting. And, and I don't know how much data you want to talk about on this show. I want but, all of it. That's so, uh, first <coughs> off, you'd, you'd be happy to know that when we did our survey statewide, um, firefighter morale is actually a little bit better than police officer morale right now. So that's good. 
for you. Um, that is good for us, but it doesn't help our cop. <laughs> and who's going to be in first? But that's the thing. We, we <laughs> like, always ride your coattails on legislation. I think this is the first time that role is going to be turned. reversed, right? But um, Well, one thing I think also people need to be aware of is the firefighter retirement is self-sustaining. Right. Yeah, you guys have funding mechanisms that law enforcement does not have. Right. We we have we've been self sustaining all along and running a positive mm -hmm. right that, and that police don't. To include disability benefits, which I'm also fighting for, but that's another you should discussion have it. for another So day, more but, data. Um so the one thing I found interesting is we, we always hear about the silent majority, right? These are the people that are content with the way things are going and they're not necessarily concerned, right? They don't they're not really vocalizing anything because they don't really have anything to complain about, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and that's and that's fine. The problem is is that police officers actually feel more support by that non-vocal majority, right, than they do by their own appointed and elected officials, right? So they trust the person that's calling them for help more than the people that are more than them. the people that are sending them there. That's disgusting. Right. Isn't it? Yeah. They, they have less trust of the media. They're appointed and elected officials than they do than the person that's actually calling them. Right. So that's I pretty mean, disheartening. For what, for what that's worth. It's not. It, well, it just tells you what our elected officials need to be aware of. I mean, the, the data of. bears out, right? Right. And so it is what it is. I, that, that's what we've been given. So I, I want to make it clear that my, my, my response to this has been holistic, right? The state is blaming the cities. The cities are blaming the state. I think that they're both equally to blame. And I think they both have spheres with which they operate that they can collectively resolve the problem. Well, I think there's two issues. I think one, they do have to fix the pay, which is local. That's absolutely true. And then the retirement has to be fixed. And I think once that happens, I think you see this recruitment and retention problem go away. Because here's the thing. What we're seeing in the media, right, we get that. But we've already shown, we, I just shown you, right, that it's the media itself that they don't trust. It's, it's, it's not the same with the citizens. They trust the citizens, right? So if the elected and appointed officials do their job and fix the recruitment and retention problem, the salary problem, they can ignore the media and go to work, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the conundrum, right? Because the elected officials need the media, and it's not popular. Yeah, they want to get elected. Right? So they need it. So it's not popular to talk about things that support police and fire. Well, mostly police right now, right? It's not popular to talk about it, so the elected official kind of stays away from it. Which, dude, thank you for what you're doing. It's a hard position to stand up for post, or for police officers in public service. Obviously, you're a chief, but you're not being the normal chief, right? You're, you're at will, right? That's what people need to understand, mm -hmm. is that most, once you make a chief position, you become an at will employee, and you're not protected under the same rights as a... Yeah, running a, the risk by even coming on the show and having this conversation. I could show risk. up to work tomorrow and not have a job, right? Do right. I think that's going to happen? No. Do I think we have a support, a, a city council that's going to be supportive of what we're doing? Yes. I have a city manager that I'm in contact with on a daily basis, and I told him I cannot wait for the day that we can talk about a different problem. The problem is, is inherently police, fire, EMS workers are the silent majority. They are afraid to speak on their own behalf. They're afraid to tell their wives they don't make enough money to live. They're afraid to tell their wives they have to go find a second job. Or husbands, I shouldn't say just wives. Wives or husbands, because there's a lot of females in the industry now, which is great. But at the same time, they're afraid to have to take, say it. Then they're afraid to complain to their boss because they don't want to get put on the back side of the pad of people they want to terminate, right? They don't want to complain to the council because then they don't want the push to the city you know, their police chief mm -hmm. or fire chief, that this guy's being a pain in the neck. They're afraid to complain to the union because the union has a hard time masking who's talking. They already know who's talking. So they end up just sitting there quiet and then hoping that their elected officials are going to swing for the fence for them, but at the same time grabbing the distrusted media mic, trying to say about all the great things and how they want to not necessarily in Utah as much of defund the police, but that's how they feel. Well, the other thing is too is, um, you know, most employees know that the largest share of any municipal budget is public safety, right? And so when you are already the biggest cost, the big, yeah, when you're already the biggest cost, then you're turning around, we need more, we need more, right? This is an issue we want more, right? I think we're at the point where we actually need more, right? We are actually seeing the true market value of a police officer and a firefighter, right? The, the days of this knuckle dragging, show up, thump someone on the head, dragging a jail, like those days are gone, mm -hmm. right? The days of showing up and just 
throwing water on a fire without any tactical decision making oh, whatsoever. Those, are those yeah. days are gone, right? We, we, we're in this environment now where we're pushing vocational training. Right, we're actually pushing vocational training. We're seeing the push towards vocational training. This, um, you know, training on 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 things that require a lot of technical expertise, writing expertise. So you don't go when you go to court, you have a good report. Right, right. You need to have almost yeah. a doctorate to write to the level that protects yourself. Yeah, you know exactly. <laughs> You're right? expecting this for yeah. So so these these jobs are actually more vo- vocational than I Physical, think people like have were. had thought they would be. Right. And so when you look at vocations such as, you know, electricians or plumbers or welders, right? They do very well when you're looking at their hourly rate. Mm-hmm. And I think we're actually starting to see the, the true and actual value of the police officer and the firefighter actually start to bear out. And there is going to be some sticker shock. The problem is, is we can't ignore all these other things such as cost savings by recruitment and retention, right, that are actually going to offset those sticker costs. By a huge amount. And the other thing, when people are looking at a budget sheet, it's pretty easy to go down the sheet and say, okay, we've got lawn and garden, roads, or whatever it is. You know, I mean, I'm, yeah. we have recreation. All those costs look smaller, but you have to keep in mind, you guys are 24 hours a day, Correct. 365 days a year. Mm-hmm. And so is fire. You are staffed, fully staffed, if you're lucky enough to live in a community that is fully staffed, 365, 24-7. And like Morgan on like Fire and Police, it's it's volunteer, and, and they do a, a good job of getting there on time. And then a diminished staff at night, which most cities do, but you guys still carry a pretty heavy staff 24-7 when you have the people, right? Yep. And I, and I don't think it's a fair number, blindly looking at black and white and saying, oh my gosh, look how much more police and fire is than rec, re, parks and rec or the street department labor payroll, right? That, that isn't quite a fair analysis, although when you're looking at a sheet, you, you have to remember it's 33% of the time. Mm-hmm. And if you're wanting 24-7 coverage, to have it be at least 30, if it's not at only 33%, it's underpaid. And I can assure you, it's probably less than 33%. Do you see what I mean mm-hmm. by that? Like if they're doing an eight hour day and these guys uh, five days a week and these guys, you've got payroll coverage, 365 days, 24 hours a day. Of course, it's going to be by far more, right? Yeah. Normal employee be. for a normal shift is 2080 a year, 2080 hours. For a standard 40 hour week. For a standard weekday. 40 hour week way, right? Yep. When you have 24 hour coverage, I mean, that is a significant multiplier. Right. Well, times three, like 6120. Right. So that's, that's a significant multiplier. <laughs> but yeah. then if you look at it and I can assure you that it's probably significant, it's more than that. It's more than 6120 because you still have to add the weekends back in. I'm not second guessing your math. I'm not, I, I don't do calculate. I, so. I second guess that part. But anyway, ultimately I think these poor guys need someone to have a voice. And for me to see you out there just trying your best to address that and bring it to the uh, attention of the state, attention of the citizens is the most important. It takes the citizens to come and reach out to your local elected officials to support this type of bill and to help come in and jump in on your legislation, right? Yeah. To help try to make those adjustments and recognize the saddest part, I think, is when people don't even pay attention to police and fire until they need them. And I'm not ashamed to say, what do you make? Oh, $15 and 35 cents an hour. What? Yeah. What? Are you kidding me? Like you should get paid way more. We got, we got pulses back. When you look at editorials, and this is all anecdotal, right? But when you look at editorials, most people are supportive of tax increases. They, they hate tax increases, but if they know a tax increase is coming, they're supportive of tax increases that are actually going towards public safety, right? I the problem the problem is, is public safety is not shiny, right? Uh, it's only there when you actually need it, right? Or it's there when you're doing 95 in Wyoming, mm. right? When you least expect it to be there, right? It's not a gym. It's not an aquatic center. It's, right. it's not a golf it. course, right? It's not just easy to go to the city council and say, hey, can I have three quarters of a million dollars, right? On a no. municipal budget. On any budget. That's a lot of money. On any budget. Right? And so I have to be able to justify that. But I do think the city council will do the right thing. Um, I'm hopeful. Um, I know that the football regarding retirement and pension for public safety in the state of Utah is actually probably, in my opinion, moved farther in the last 30 days than it has in the last 10 years. That's amazing. So hopefully we can keep that momentum. I think ultimately conversations are hard. We can bring people with opposing variation in opinions, right? Like As this. long as they don't offend me. 
And then I don't want to have. I'm just waiting for the cameras to be off. Let me let me tell you. (laughs) I've been just just fighting at the bit to do this. But ultimately, I think the conversation component is is super sad. Like bringing in Ken, right? I'm going to throw him under the bus again because he's the Democrat in the room, right? But what you mean, communist? Communist. Wow. (laughs) Right. That's he, what that period he was tilts, for. He tilts that <laughs> way a little bit. But we had this conversation up front when, when we were interviewing, and, I, and he's like, we, we are polar opposite. Well, until we realize we're polar opposite on the big view. And so we could, t- have, take, we could have taken positions that were super argumentative. But then as we talked our way through the conversation, we realized we're really just walking on the middle line of the road mm-hmm. and we're pretty much holding hands. There's just about 2% or 3% of the issues that we have a varying degree of opinion on. But if you were to look at us, he would be completely different than I am politically. And you would say, hey, those guys, you're going to put the oil and water together. But I would say he's one of my favorite people to discuss things with. He doesn't go in. He says, hey, just, just kicking this in as a, for the opposing side it's really kind of refreshing to be able to sit back and hopefully I handle his comments correctly, but I don't, I, I I try to learn from his view too. But that's what, I mean, that's where social media does is a disservice, right? There's this, there's, there's this imaginary wall, right? Where I am not going to be held accountable for anything I do or say on social media. So I can say whatever I want, whether it's anecdotal, whether it's supported by evidence, I can be as cruel as I want and I'm not going to suffer any repercussions. It's a lot different when we're having this conversation face to face, Mm -hmm. right? Because now I'm here actually having this conversation with you and there is no wall, right? And so I'm not going to be free to do what I say or want without being, held accountable by whatever consequences come my way. Mm -hmm. And so what I can tell you, and, and I didn't know this, you know, when I got elected to the house, but, um, we, we go through an education period where we're taught about the house rules on the floor. And some of those rules are things like you don't call any representative by name. You talk not to them, but through the speaker. And so you're speaking through this third party using third person. And it, it, it's amazing what it does to take that emotional, component out of the debate and so it so easily removes all that vitriol that you can see on social media. Well kind of you still see some of the vitriol. You see some of it and they get their digs in but I'll tell you what it was fascinating and I was actually quite relieved when I got down there and I was able to see this debate and free flow of ideals and ideologies and um, you know these opposing sides of whatever topic you may have And there was no ill will at the end of that discussion, right? The vote was cast, and then at the end, whatever happened, happened, and it was over. (laughs) And then you moved on. And then you still ate lunch together. You still shook hands and laughed and joked in the hallway, right? And while we may not be very supportive or happy with our elected officials, that is the one thing that they are capable of doing that we're unfortunately not able to do ourselves out on the street. And so that is one aspect of that environment down there that I'm, I'm really appreciating, right? Mm. Is to be able to have these conversations. And, and I can see that in my head. That's when you say that I can't even visualize it. Yeah. It's, it was, it was, it was, I was taken back for sure. Mm. So you had a lot of big eye openers. Yeah. How's the ride been doing it through this, um, through this whole pandemic? and the- So I didn't get to really feel like a freshman legislature when there was, you know, no raucous capital rotunda floor, right, that just was filled with people. It was very, very, very quiet. Um, so I hear that's actually going to change. But as far as learning, I think that was something that I actually got to appreciate. And I got to um, actually focus on my learning about how things work down there as opposed to someone who gets down there and on day one, they're constantly having to deal with special interest groups, members of the general public, and any time they leave the floor, just getting bombarded with people who wanted to vote one way or another. Mm -hmm. So So for people that are outsiders like me, that I haven't ever been involved in politics, ultimately, what would you say through what you've seen? has been the most surprising component and what someone should expect if they entertain it, that it was like, holy crap, this is number one. I have this much, much horsepower or I don't, or the stuff I, you know, we, we go in and our politicians tout this horn of what they're running on and what their true abilities to make changes are. What are the things that have been kind of an opening eye opener outside of the topic of retirement? I would just, 
Well, for me, I mean, again, so for me, the biggest eye opener was this ability to have these debates and in this controlled environment and where things weren't taken personal. The other thing is, too, is, again, we have these preconceived notions about how the world works or the way things should or should not be. And we have to understand and be receptive to the fact that, one, not everybody agrees with this. And we have to be open to data that may actually contrast with what we think or see, right? And so if you compartmentalize, sure, you can get through any problem by just not ever budging on any issue, right? But, I mean, who are you doing a disservice to? Well, your constituents, right? So there are times where you have to make tif- difficult decisions. And sometimes you actually have to make a decision based on information that you didn't have, right? So you have to be able to step up and say, well, I believe this until I got this information. And I actually, yeah, I changed my mind. Sorry. Right. Can I change my mind? Should I be able to change my mind? Absolutely. Should I be doing that? Absolutely. Right. If, if the I'm information, down, right. if the information is correct. Right. right. Yeah. So I, you know, so do you think that's why when public officials and we sit back and say, that guy's so full of crap, I can hardly yeah, stand flip it. flopper, right. Flip flopper. Do you think that, that, a lot of the time, or do you feel like it's a tool they use? To, I'm sure it's both, right? Yeah. To get into office, one. But for two, they get in there in this belief that they're going to make a change to something they strongly dislike. But when they get to the data that they didn't have access to post, they realize like, oh. Yeah, I, that actually happened to me on, my, on, on, on the city council, right? I went in, you know, with my pitchfork and torches and screaming, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And about six months in, we're having this pretty heated discussion about a pretty salient topic in, in that city. And one of the council members leans over the dais. He's on one end, and I'm at the other. And he just looks over and he goes, awfully quiet down there, Matt. Right? That was that was an eye-opener for me because I'd been saying all these things. And I didn't necessarily have the information. Right? And now I'm being taken to task on what am I going to do? How am I going to vote now that I have this new information? So... You know, people in their campaigning, yeah, they're they're going to be saying a lot of things. They want to get elected. Sure. But what I can tell you is a lot of the people, all the people that I met down there, while we may disagree ideologically on a lot of things, I really do think that they're genuine in their interest in wanting to do what's right for their constituency. And relationships are important. So I want them to understand or believe that even though they may disagree with me, that I'm doing what's in the best interest of my constituents. Right. Right. Ideologically, we can disagree all day long, but as long as we understand that we are doing in good faith what we should be doing, that's not your we can personal get past agenda. That. Correct. Yeah, and that's I think where we get jaded. I think social media is the biggest tool because you choose to click on whatever your clickbait is. Yeah. You follow down the pathway, and you're going to get fed whatever information best suits your interest mm-hmm. to keep you online. Right? You never, you never hear about the debates in committee or on the House floor or the Senate floor that are bipartisan and are not raucous. Right, Ever. like ninety percent of the work that gets done gets work done gets done on a bipartisan basis but without that's so any. Boring. Con- it is boring. <laughs> you guys right? didn't fight. Yeah, right. You held. So, you're not holding it up. Yeah. So the, the the only part that we ever hear about is the parts that are messy, and. You know, it's obviously spun before it ever gets to any of us as a But viewer. that's media in general, right? Mm-hmm. And so our it's consumerism. It's the only part that keeps people interested, or at least that's what they feel. So now we have this extremely divided sense of community, visually, media-wise, social media-wise. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to sit down, like we were talking, on, I think, with Randy or Kevin, when we were sitting here last, I, I spent a lot of time on the road, and I don't feel the divide anywhere. I sit at restaurants and on airplanes and... There's a lot of, I think there's a lot of love in general amongst everyone, regardless if they want to wear masks or not wear masks. People don't really care. They just don't want to be stepped on for their own opinions, right? Right. Right. And I just bring masks up for that end. But there's a lot oh, of I people think on a good time to talk about masks. Political, right? It is a good time. But at the same time, then we have political variation and visual opinion of what people think. And I think ultimately, at the end of the day, just like, when, when Ken and I were talking, it, it's the same thing. We really are really close to the same ideologies. We all want the same thing. Happy, healthy family, happy, healthy neighborhood, happy, healthy community, state, and nation, right? But we are so polarized and being divided at not even our will and not knowing. We're just being programmed and channeled through our media, right? And I don't mean that in a conspiracy method, but when I, I can tell you, when I click on something next to you, know my next 10 posts are about that. I don't think it is a conspiracy. Look at the Petito case. Right. That, right. That is sad. 
It's very sad, and it's sad that it's being exploited in the way that it's being exploited. Okay. Why? I feel bad for that cop. Exactly. They're pointing fingers for it's, him. Like yeah. He, there was no reason. He it, did what he could. That occurred a month ago. <clears throat> that and was like all a over. month before. The, oh, really? Well, I, and, and the way I thought it was like a week or a day. Yeah, no. That was, that was <laughs> long before she was murdered, huh? Yeah. Wow. Right? So... If it's just there, look at what? every avenue. Yeah, and, and so, but that sells, right? That's flashy, right? We're looking out as the media, what's in your best interest as the public, but are you? No. Anything that's dividing us right now is the least helpful thing that we could have, right? I, I, we need to do more of what's uniting and more of just conversation, of just true, what is your true feelings? I was talking to a kid, you got my hair cut today for you. It really looks nice. like mine, it's amazing. You're welcome. I think we had the same hairline up here. Yeah. So he said that his family, his mother-in-law, excuse me, his father-in-law passed away, right? And his wife, the, the, or the, his father-in-law passed away, the mother-in-law and all the siblings decided if they weren't vaccinated, they can't come to the funeral, mm -hmm. right? So they're not allowed to come to the funeral unless they get the vaccine. Really? Well, then he'll go, right? He doesn't, he's obviously, he's in the military and he doesn't want to go and he's not, he says, it looks like I'm going to be getting dishonorably discharged, right? So he's, they're taking the discharge. I have another kid that's working here that's in the military that's going to be discharged. He's like, I'm just not taking it, right? So you're, you're seeing this huge fallout of that. But then it gets down to the family level where you're not even allowed to come to a funeral of your own dad. Like his wife's not allowed to go unless she gets the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And he said that there, she's an extremist, right? She was 18 months never leaving the house because of her fear. Now, if it is what it is, if she's afraid of it, fine. But now she, this girl's really frustrated to the point where she's looking at how does she separate from her mother, like on legally, not being allowed to be related. I'm like, this is how dividing this little thing is. And ultimately, I, you can't sit in other people's, you know, I, I don't have their lenses on. I'm not wearing their glasses to understand why they they visually see something that way. But it's really disheartening to see families fall apart over political positions. Yeah. And people argue it's not a, polit a political thing. Well, it isn't. It is a health-related thing, but it's being used to politically, in political manners that are really divisive. Well, and that's just it, right? So I have this conversation with my students, this idea of negative liberty and positive liberty. No one here agrees that we should have the liberty to right. do what we want, right? Right. Limits. But, but you have this idea of positive liberty and negative liberty. Conservatives typically believe that the less the government is involved, then the more free I am, right? But then you have this other idea of liberty, which is I'm actually more free if the government involves, right? I'm less free if the government cannot require me to wear a mask, okay? Then the other argument is I'm actually more free if the government requires you to wear a mask because I don't have to worry about getting covid from you right and so we just need to understand that again our goals i think as a society overall are probably the same right 100%. we want to get through life we want to have a family we want you see what i'm saying the community the yeah. neighborhood what we schooling. disagree on is how we get there and the media i think has done a phenomenal job of exploiting that right and making that's it so just, divisive that's, that's just the opinion to mcquin well and i that's think it. it's the right opinion I just think ultimately we really are only, we'd only know what's going on because of the media. And so now we're really giving the tools to the media to let us know what's going on. It's just a vicious circle. But at the end of the day, sitting up on a lake and no TV, the only thing I'll know is like, did I catch anything today? Is it raining? Well, let me look outside. Yeah, it's raining. Right. Or is it going to, I think I was telling Shannon on the way home last night, I'm like, you know how easy it would be just to be able to do that? And just dis just disconnect from everything, and then forget about these congressmen and senators that are fighting for stuff that really have no ultimate effect on me here. Right, right. At the end of the day, they really only have the effect of what we allow them to have effect on. Now that may be naive, but as much as we want as free people to keep our liberties for ourselves, <clears throat> we can we have right now the opportunity to earn what we want to make put forth the effort that we want to put forth into it, live the life that we want to live, educate our kids the way we want. It just takes individual effort, mm -hmm. right? As long as we're wanting to give less effort, this is going to get me beat up. Just so you know, as long as we want to give less effort and we want other people to take those responsibilities for us, 
then you're going to have to have that. So that, that, but that's the conundrum, right? I mean, we are, we are direct beneficiaries of this government that we have implicitly created. And the more uninvolved we become, then the less control we have. Now we sit there and say, well, you, you know, you need, you work for me. You're my boss. I'm your constituents. I, I get that. The problem is, is the electorate as a whole is pretty apathetic, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and they don't necessarily always think about the, the quality of the service they're being provided is literally a direct result of who won in the last election. Period. Whether it be a municipal election or a state election, right? And so the electorate, which is apathetic, I appreciate when they get frustrated and are driven to participate, but municipal elections are still like 18 to 22 percent. I think it goes up like 25 or 30 percent with mail. Actively voting. Actively voting. So that's where people want to complain but don't participate. You got to participate. Right. Bottom line. And here's the thing. Guess what? Your elected officials want you to participate. You know what? I'm not going to vote because my vote doesn't matter. No. How do you uh, like that answer? I I lost by, I think it was like 21 votes or something once. All right. So it it, It it, it does matter. And it especially matters at the local level, which we know is those elections where most people are apathetic. Well, that's the person. It should be the exact opposite, right? If you're going to vote in an election where someone has the greatest effect on your daily life, that is the local election, right? If we want to see 18 to 22% turnout, perhaps that should be at the federal level. So look who's making your decisions. Yeah. The ones on social media you can't stand that are really loud politically, right? Yeah. Right. Fine. But at the same day, I'm voting, Mm -hmm. right? If you want to counteract my vote or zero, you better show up to the polls. Right. So right now, when you say, hey, I can't stand all these political conversations. Well, that's probably the 18 to 22 percent of the people that are voting that you can't stand the vote. If you don't think your vote matters, then silence those guys by voting and then having a majority of the people that you know that vote or like what you like participate in voting as well. But that just shows you how open the field is. Right. If there's only 18 to 22 percent, let's call it 20 percent. That means you have a 5x opportunity to tilt a vote. The more people you get involved, the pe- employers, I employ them to give them time off to go vote, right? Mm-hmm. We can, we will, right? We'll let, I think we did this time, made sure everybody went and voted. Is he going to let you go vote? Um, no. Ken has, uh, he's <laughs> actually, we have a, co- see his ankle? It's tied to that table. <laughs> <laughs> we ha- he has to check, he has a button he pushes for bathroom breaks because I don't want him to go vote on other things, anything in the office. You never know. <laughs> He, he probably wants a community kitchen for everybody to eat. I'm actually leading the, the staff out in the shop to u- unionize. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. So. <laughs> the MDU, <laughs> the MD union, right? <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, ultimately, it matters. But look how big of an effect we have. If we only have a 20% activity, look what we can do. Our power is, is in the majority of our ability to make changes. If it was at a 90% vote rate, then it would be tougher to make the changes to our favor, right? Well, the greater, when I say your, to our the, favor the greater your voter turnout, right? The more centrist your policies are probably going to become. That, that's my thing. I right? guess that's the plain and simple way to put it, way to make it easy. I just, and, and again, I'm not <laughs> saying I'm, you know, one of my professors might come out and tell me I was absolutely wrong by saying that, right? But I mean, if I'm someone who's running a campaign and I know I only have to cater to 20% of the electorate and I know which... 20% electorate, vote. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it, if, if I'm someone who, um, you know, knows the basics of economics, supply and demand, all that other stuff, I'm going to spend my time and effort recruiting that 20% vote. Do you know right? the, the, what's the, the demographic of the voters? What would you, what is the standard demographic of voters? So it actually, I mean, I data. don't know what it is for Utah, but we get data all the way to the precinct level. And so it can actually change from precinct to precinct, right? What I can tell you, though, is like when I was campaigning for city council, if your lawn had a flagpole on it, I was knocking on your door because you were likely to vote, right? And the other thing I, I have learned, one every day. And, you're, fly, fly. and you're likely to vote. I right? do. The other thing yeah. I learned, too, is a lot, of the, a lot of the people, when we talk about apathetic you know, voters, I would knock on their door for a city council election, and they wouldn't, wanna ha- they wouldn't even discuss the issues with me. The mere fact that I knocked on their door and that was the first time a candidate had ever knocked on their door, that was enough to get their vote. 
I could have been the absolute worst candidate with the absolute worst policy ideas on the planet. And you still got it. But the fact that I knocked on their door is what mattered to them. Hmm. Okay, that is what happens when you have an apathetic electorate, right? And so, yes, we elect people to do our bidding on our behalf. That's why they're called representatives, right? You're there to make the best decision that you can on my behalf. But when and where I can be involved, I probably should be involved. And as an elected official, I like to know where my constituents stand because it actually helps make some of those salient decisions easier. Well, you can pass it off, right? Like this is what my majority says they want. Mm -hmm. And then I don't have a moral problem. I may, may have a moral problem or a personal problem with the way the constituents want me well, to Well, I think it's win-win, right? Because morally, my job is to go down there and present them in their absence. But two, at the same time, if they've come out at a certain po uh, in, uh, with a certain position on a particular policy issue, even if it's in contrast with what I believe, if they and the majority want me to vote that way, then... That's your obligation. That's my obligation to vote mm -hmm. that way. So I think ethically, morally, I think that's, that's, like, that's a win-win for me, right? Well, yeah, if they're not involved better. and I make the wrong decision, you know, how am I going to be able to defend making that decision? Well, it's hard enough to sleep at night, let alone having those demons yeah, I don't. Head. I don't sleep, dude. No, you don't. probably don't. You got too many guys yeah. to worry about all night. I don't sleep. Who are we going to pull over, right? Right. Well, I, the other thing is, too, is, I mean, if I know my phone's going to ring at 2 o'clock in the morning, I might as well just stay awake. Right. So. It's true. Well, as the majority of our elected officials, do you feel like they do the same thing as that? Do you think they really lean to their constituents or do you think there's more self-serving than we think? I'm just asking for my own. Well, I mean, it would be nice for me to say that no one goes down there. I mean, and are self-serving, right? Obviously I have some self-interest in wanting to get involved, right? It's something I enjoy. I personally enjoy going down there. I personally enjoy that environment. I find it challenging, right? So there is some self-gratification by being in that position. Right. And, and, and I think it takes, you know, a mentality and a certain temperament and all those things to, to want to be down there. Right. Mm -hmm. Because when, when we look at Congress or when we look at state legislators, right. They overall, the opinion of the legislature or Congress is not that great. But when you actually look at a constituent's opinion of their representative, right. Typically they get reelected because they are, um, they are well respected by their individual constituents, right? So it's this it's this irony, right? We hate the state legislature, state legislature. We hate Congress, but we love our congressperson and we love our state rep. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so that's funny, but I, it's true. It, oh, it's absolutely <laughs> true, right? It's 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 ironic, but uh, no. Everyone I met down there and and had these conversations with, I believe they are genuinely down there for the right reasons and they have the best interests of their constituents constituents in their heart the issue that right now it seems like people have a tendency to attack you guys more than they have constructive questions and i may be wrong because that's probably what media captures oh no i get email lists i get emails all the time from these listservs where people just plug in their name and their address and then i get this awful email about i'm your boss and i demand you do this and right. how dare you and then i mean you're like you are but along with you and 35,000 other people or 50,000 other people. Who are subscribing to the same email list. Right, that right? you're sending your... So I'm probably, I'm going to read the first one, but if all the emails have the same subject line, I'm going to read one, and, know and what the rest means. are going to get deleted. Now, if you're someone who actually sends me an email, say you go through the state website or you go through my own campaign website, you send me an email, <laughs> it's going to get read and I'm going to respond. Matt, right? do you want to share your campaign website? It's uh, gwynforuthouse.org. Okay, so Gwyn for uthouse.org. Is that the number four? Gwyn, the number four, G W Y N N, number okay. four, uthouse.org. So they can send me emails there. They can send me emails through the state legislative website. So when I get those emails, I know where they come from, and I know that the constituent has actually proactively went to either website, and they've actually went through the time and effort to create a body and ask a question, right? It's not being done on some email server Past back east and just being blown at me, right? So those are the emails I respond to, and those are the ones that I want to get. Right. When's your election? So redistricting is going on right now. So um, my next, I'll start campaigning next, um, after the next legislative session. So next year, it's every two years. It's every two years. So remember, support Matt, right? If you guys have questions for Matt, I'm using Matt. Have you had that? Yeah, Matt, thanks. Support him. Contact him through his emails. Make it genuine. Ask him hard questions. He wants them. I'm sure. I've been able. I've had the opportunity to work with him. I've known him. Oh, I guess almost 12 years now. 
which oh, it's been a long 12 years. Yeah, our relationship that goes is now almost preteen. I know it is. It's, mm-hmm. it's just there. But at the same time, good, hard questions are available. You handle them fine. You're a grown man. And please just ask the With good feelings. Question. With actually, feelings. So yeah. make sure they're softened. Uh, he does have a cry room at the office. So right behind his chief's desk, he has a little room. It's soft walls and a beanbag tissues. Hidden by a Murphy door. Hidden by a Murphy door. We installed that last week. Just kidding, he hasn't found it yet. But ultimately, no, I, I challenge everybody, if you have questions and you want to know more about Tier 2 or you feel like you can help with Tier 2, to reach out. And if you're actively in the state and there's more questions you need clarity on. I've been involved. I, I know how it feels to be in it. And I, I, I had to questions myself. So we act like we know more than we do sometimes. So reach out to somebody that knows. And then I think Matt would be happy to teach as well as converse and show you why if you have an opposing opinion... I'm willing to hear it. I'm sure. Absolutely. Right. And if you have something for it that he could also bring to the table that it helped push that goal of helping stabilize our public service, you'd appreciate that too. So anything and everything you guys can do for, for that to help our public service and the people that are there to help us when we meet, need it most, please, please be there. So Matt, thank you for coming in today and we truly appreciate it and best of luck. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great one. See ya. See ya. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to 90 Proof Wisdom Podcast. Hopefully, there was a takeaway for you. If you like what we're doing or even our efforts, tell your friends about it. Let us know what we could do better. Again, thank you for listening to 90 Proof Wisdom Podcast. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button.